Hey, everybody, and welcome to another week of Elixir Mix. Today, it's just a couple of panelists. There's myself, Josh Adams, and Michael. Say hey. Hey, everybody. How's it going? This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So today we were just going to have a discussion about uh, sort of deployment. I think it'll probably, probably wander around a little bit. Yeah, we're um, we're gonna go through some examples of uh, of maybe mistakes we've made in our own projects early on, or some common pitfalls that we've seen people falling into in their you know maybe their first one or two production uh, Elixir systems, and uh, maybe just give a heads up for anyone who's about to get these things rolling on a new project. Okay, so the official title then is production pitfall pontification. Ooh. I like the alliteration. All, All right. right. So um, I will get started with perhaps a, uh, a discussion of a thing that is totally acceptable to do that I also don't like doing. And then uh, we can see how you feel about it. So Heroku deployments. Heroku deployments are fine. I've deployed things uh, in Elixir in production on Heroku that have run for years and are still running. And uh, it works just great in general. But these days, I, I don't do it. I actually go out of my way not to do it. And I uh, recently listened to another podcast that was talking about them uh, as a thing you definitely shouldn't overlook. And I agree that you shouldn't dismiss them out of hand generally. Um, but I also find it interesting that I, I don't think I dismiss it out of hand, but I dismiss it as an option myself on, on every project these days. So how do you feel about Heroku, Michael? Uh, so I've, I've only ever done a very small amount of stuff on Heroku. Um, I, I kind of like got started as a software engineer on a company that was rolling their own hardware. And uh, so I, I just, I've always felt pretty comfortable with, I don't know, setting up a, a load balancer with Nginx. Um, so I, I have very little experience. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the gotchas that can go along with that. So, um, you know, if, uh, dynos can be put to sleep and spun up kind of whenever and um, and maybe you need to plan a little bit around that um but i've i've heard generally just good things that it's a it's a fairly simple way to get things going i'd be here curious to hear a little bit more josh about um what are the gotchas that you've run into or what are the things that push you away from that decision at this point uh for me the the biggest thing that pushes me away from it is uh i think lack of control which is explicitly the thing you're trying to give up with a pass but um, as an example, we have a pretty standard Rails app that uh, we're helping someone out with, and it's deployed on Heroku. And we normally don't do things on Heroku these days, but we did it because they have existing developers and they're familiar with Heroku, and we said, super, it'll, it'll be fine. It's Ruby. And um, we have spent upwards of 40 hours trying to diagnose uh, just actual wrong things that are happening on the platform. Like, it'll run the it'll run a release with the wrong version of Ruby. And like, I have no real insight. I mean, I guess I could start messing with the build pack to, to debug it, but like I have no debugability. I can't just get on the box and literally apt install a package that is, that makes diagnosis helpful. And uh, anyway, so like, I don't want to get into the details because it's very boring and I've wasted a week of my life on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, the point is now I'm like, I'm going out to support. I spent 40 hours on a thing. I literally could have had a Kubernetes cluster running that does my production stuff in a day. So I'm 32 hours past what it would have taken me to set up Kubernetes like production ready forever, go forward. So that on its own, I feel like my big reason is ultimately I don't feel like the bargain with Heroku ends up being worth it. 
Um, similarly, I had a had a buddy who scaled up an app pretty substantially on Heroku, and they were spending thousands of dollars a month on hosting. And uh, I pivoted them to a Kubernetes cluster, and in three months, they uh, they sort of paid off the time it took uh, via savings to to actually do the Kubernetes swap. And now they have more flexibility. Like we're doing cool stuff with the platform now that we couldn't reasonably do without Kubernetes underneath it. Anyway, so those are my reasons. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a few other alternatives that maybe we should um, mention here. Um, so one I'll drop in is called Nanobox. Um, and they have, uh, they recently got acquired by DigitalOcean. Uh, they have kind of a similar target audience to Heroku. Um, but, but maybe they, they let you get your fingers just a little bit more into what's happening than Heroku does. Um, there's, uh, also a, a platform called Gig Elixir, which is again about making it really simple and you don't have to think about a lot of hardware concerns and choices up front. So we'll drop both those into the, the show notes. Those would be good, um, things to also consider if, if you find yourself, um, thinking about those kinds of like, Hey, I just want to get something running and, and I don't want to make a lot of decisions. I'll say from my experience, um, the, the place I usually fall in terms of like how much I want to want worry about hardware and how much I don't does kind of fall pretty neatly into, um, something like AWS EC2 or, uh, you know, or, or similar products. Um, the company I'm at right now, we, we chose to use Google's managed Kubernetes instance. So like, I don't have to worry about managing the actual hardware. I don't have to worry about managing Kubernetes itself, which is a bit to deal with. Um, but it's trivially easy to just be like, oh, I, I, I need a full core and this much RAM available, and I want to go run this thing inside of there. Just pick some machine that has that space and put me there. Um, but you could still SSH to it. Um, you can still, inside of that thing, you can still uh, install packages, um, all that kind of stuff. So to me, that, that's a great trade-off. Um, gives me enough ability to, to like push and like push the pieces of hardware that are actually powering my app and feel like I can be connected to those, but, um, but saves me some of the pain of, of dealing with those choices up front, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's exactly what I push people to do. I think using GKE and just setting up a, a Kubernetes cluster on it is uh, just kind of the perfect mix of uh, easy but not restrictive. Yep, I'd agree. That's that's the sweet spot that I found after you know being. I we did try uh, a deployment to Nanobox for a little while. Um, like I said, I had a good experience there. But, um, but I do like to just have a little bit more control to say, hey, I'm going to evict this piece. Like, this box seems to be frozen up. I'm going to evict it, and please give me a new one. Um, or just, like, easily say, oh, I want to scale up, you know, one more chunk of hardware um, separate from what's running on that hardware. Um, so it's, it's, a good, it's a good level of abstraction for what my team needs. Um, but, but I will say I've, you know, lots of, you know, lots of people who have, I've gotten a long way down the road with services like Heroku, Nanobox, Giglixer. Um, I think they can be great. Um, and uh, if I was if I was working with a team of people who had very little DevOps background and just wanted to get something up and off the ground, I'd maybe start with Giglixer just since it's so uh, tailored to Elixir and Phoenix deployments. Um, so you'll probably have a little less gotchas out of the gate with this specific tool set. Yeah, and I don't. While I do um, avoid using Heroku personally, I completely understand. I feel like there's a very solid sweet spot that it lives in, right? Like, if you're not spending two hundred bucks a month on hosting, like, don't you probably don't want to run a, a Kubernetes cluster on Google Managed because that's about what you're going to pay to run sort of free nodes. Um, but once you're doing that, you can put a whole lot of stuff on it. So, like, for the super duper early stage startup, doesn't want to spend an extra. 150 bucks a month because they have actually no funding like that makes total sense for a side project it makes total sense but honestly if you're kind of doing the thing at scale i think you need to own your your op space just a little bit more i'm not suggesting that you hire three operations engineers I'm just i like having control 
<laughs> this is maybe revealing more about us as panelists than, than it is about the tools. That's um, completely fair. <laughs> I will say though, I think there is a, a general kind of cultural philosophy in the Erlang and Elixir ecosystem um, around runtime tooling and introspection, right? So if you think about things like Observer um, or the ability to get a remote console that's run literally in the same operating system process as your production code, that is such a powerful way to interact with, with what's happening in production and to debug things and understand what state your app has gotten into. Um, it, to me, that does lend itself towards a set of tools where, where you're a little bit more directly connected to that, where you're not so far separated from this is the code I wrote and here's where it's running. Like it, it has a place that it's running that I can get to. Um, that is, I, I want to stay connected to that because there's a lot of tools that the ecosystem provides me if I can um, be connected to where that process is running in production. Yeah, I think that's, thank you for pointing that out. That's a really important reason that I, I think it's valuable to run like in a release in the normal style for an Elixir app because there is a lot of operational tooling that you just don't have if you're running mixphoenix.server on Heroku. Yep. Um, I know another topic that we wanted to cover um, was around configuration. So um, this is something, I, if anyone wants to go search configuration on the Elixir forum and spend the next week of their lives reading lots of opinions, uh, they're welcome to. Uh, we'll, I'll try to distill it down to like the most common um, error or um, mistake that people make in this space. So probably people have like some uh, Phoenix project uh, or, or some project that they're deploying and, um, and maybe in their config.exs file, they have a system.getenv call in there where they're going to pull out an environment variable and use that to decide where the database lives or something else along those lines. Um, and so if that's kind of your starting point and then you hear about releases and distillery, uh, or maybe you read the brand new blog post that just came out from Jose um, yesterday as of the time of this recording, uh, talking about how Elixir 1.9 is, is baking in releases um, into the top level mix tool. Uh, then maybe you decided, oh, we, sh we should be doing this thing. Like um, releases have some benefit to us and our product. Um, and on your first release, you'll probably find out that um, what happens when you run that is that the config.exs file runs one time on some machine, maybe on your laptop or maybe on a CI machine, and that machine is what runs system.getenv. And then whatever came back from that, whatever the environment variable was on that machine, that gets baked into the configuration all the places that that code gets run. It doesn't get rerun on, on each machine. And so now, you know, maybe you had some blanks in there and your app doesn't start up properly uh, on the production uh, servers. So this is a mistake I've made uh, at least once, uh, no, at least twice on projects that I've uh, switched to releases at some point. There are, obviously there are very strong use cases and arguments for um, using releases. Um, so there's uh, one of the, one of those, big uh, advantages it gives you is that it loads all of the modules uh, at the very beginning before it boots up your app. And so there's no lazy loading, there's no waiting for things to um, get loaded into the VM. Um, and so you don't kind of have these, these first couple of requests being slower than the rest. And, uh, and that provides um, some, some real value depending on what your team is doing and where they're at. So um, in any case, you, you, you now have to face the problem of compile time configuration versus runtime configuration. And um, there's lots of good information on this. Uh, we'll drop a link in our show notes to uh, Jose's blog post where he talks about how they're breaking out the, um, how they're taking the configuration part of mix and they're pulling that into the core language. Um, that's something that's very new as of the time of this recording, but there's also some projects out there that really are focused on solving this problem in a good way. So um, we'll also link to a package called Conform. This is, uh, it's uh, maintained by Paul Schoenfelder, Bitwalker. Um, someone really needs to like send lots of cookies or bagels or donuts or whatever it is that Paul Schoenfelder loves because that guy puts out a whole lot of projects and useful tools for the community. 
Um, and, but conform is about uh, helping to give you um, some really cool runtime configuration options. Um, uh, real quick, it's worth mentioning that conform has been deprecated for about a year. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so he's got a Tomal Elixir, which is uh, what he's sort of switched to focusing on, Tomal Dash Elixir. Okay, Th this is actually really good to know. So Tomal Elixir, um, we'll also link to that. Um, and then what's um, Chris Keithley? Also, he's been talking about... Uh, yeah, his was very interesting. I really, I wanted to, I was in the middle of trying to look it up because I've forgotten what it's called. Vapor. Vapor. Yeah. Yep, so um, Vapor, I know also um, the emphasis of Vapor is that uh, you can actually change your configuration during the runtime. So it's not just... At, at the time that your application starts, that it'll read a Toml file or a, an environment variable, et cetera. Um, Vapor is, is, you can say, tell it like, hey, I want you to check the configuration every 10 seconds um, and, uh, and then update things based on that configuration changing. So um, another very powerful set of tools um, that would give you the ability, for instance, to like have a control dashboard where maybe you can say, oh, I want, uh, all the copies of the app running over here to switch to a new master database, um, something like that. Um, obviously, lots of concerns and, and uh, problems to solve uh, with live updating your configuration and something you'd have to plan for, but that's a, a very powerful set of tools that you can, that you can build in. So um, lots of options around this, but I'd say the main takeaway from this point is if you're doing system.getenv, or anything like that in, in any of your .exs files, config.exs, dev.exs, et cetera. Um, when you switch to releases, make sure you just run through and look at all those things and ask yourself, is this, is this something that I only need to know one answer for, for all of my servers, or is this something that each of my servers needs to answer this question when they're starting up? Yeah, and I would also uh, mention just if you're using distillery releases, my prefer what I would really ultimately like to have is something like Vapor um, for real runtime config changes. But until I go there, I am totally happy with just using uh, replace OS vars, which lets you just wire in environment variables at runtime. So obviously, this is just happening at at the boot of the Elixir application. But I've seen a lot of people like kind of poo poo on it a little bit. Uh, I think largely because you don't have uh, very, you, you can basically only put strings or numbers and you have to parse them, et cetera. Uh, but I've used it in production for forever and I basically never run up against anything that is too problematic without it. I can understand if someone has really, really detailed and complex configuration, they might want to reach for something better. But if you just need to swap out some environment variables, like look at replace OS bars, it's a good tool. That's uh, that's so interesting because I I'm in the exact same place. I've I've been wanting to do something like Vapor for a long time, but I really don't have a project that needs it. Um, none of none of my applications uh, really need to change their behavior, you know, from minute to minute, or else it's easy enough just to to like hit the redeploy button um, and just roll out a new set of them that will that will boot now with the new environment variable present. Um, that's always been a good enough solution that it wasn't worth a lot of effort to change. Um, that being said, um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll note that the, the foundations of the tools we're building on here, OTP itself, has this concept in an application. Uh, there's, a, there's a function when you generate an OTP application called config changed. And that hook exists specifically so that when configuration changes at runtime in the middle of your process running, that you can decide what to do with that new, um, that new configuration. And so, so these are tools that are built very deeply into the, into the platform because they have been useful for people using them, these tools. Um, we have an amazing set of tools that make this possible, but, but maybe it falls into that, um, that realm of, if you don't need to go down that rabbit hole right now, you know, then using replace OS bars, it's a great solution. It'll get you pretty far for an awful lot of applications. And, um, and then when you do find yourself needing, uh, oh, I really wish I could change which Redis instance I'm pointing to in the middle of uh, serving requests or, or something along those lines. Great. Uh, look into Vapor. 
um, look into some of these other tools. Yeah, I think I think ultimately something like Vapor combined with Kubernetes config maps is where I want to end up. Yeah, uh, that that will be a very uh, powerful set of tools. I'm uh, I'm anxious to hear Josh when you when you get to a project that uh, where you where you find a really good reason to have that in production and. Uh, so this I, is this kind of feeds into why I I think using something like Kubernetes or really owning your ops stuff is important because at this point like I've done all the the hard work for the basics of running Elixir apps in production on Kubernetes so it's somewhat trivial for me to play with that um, whereas if you know if I hadn't then I could imagine never even trying it because like there's a whole lot of setup before I even get to play but I mean it wouldn't be hard to to play with something like that at this point. I think that's a really good um, general life hack. Uh, if you're going to be a software engineer, that means you kind of opted into a career where everything changes all the time. <laughs> um, you know, maybe we're maybe not a lot of listeners here live very heavily in like the NPM community, for instance. But you know, if you look around, basically all software communities move pretty quickly. We we tend to make fun of JavaScript for having new frameworks every five seconds, but that that's you know, the reality is that the Elixir community is not that far different from that. Like if, if you were an accountant as a profession and you looked at Elixir community and JavaScript community, you would probably make the same joke about both of us. Um, and we're, we're closer than we sometimes, uh, than there's sometimes the way that we talk about it. Um, and, and because you have kind of chosen to live in that career where everything's changing all the time, a really good career hack is to find excuses to play with things. And so maybe you're not sure whether your app uh, has any strong advantage from using something like Vapor or Config Maps or Kubernetes. Um, if, if you're not sure and you don't know, it's probably not a great time to like spend your startup's limited funds to, um, to answer that question with a new production app, but maybe there's an internal tool where you can just try it out. And if you spend four hours, or if you go to a conference talk to learn about it, or if you offer to give a meetup presentation or a conference presentation to force yourself to learn about it, those are all great ways to make yourself familiar with the trade-offs that are happening. And, um, and just like Josh said, the, the first time that I actually got a managed Kubernetes cluster up and running and realized, oh, that was you know, about a fifth the amount of work that I thought it was going to be to get my app running and, and not have to worry about this anymore. Um, that changed how much of a trade-off I thought I was going to have to make. And with that new information, it's easier for me now to, to weigh that trade-off and, and know when I want to read for it and, and when I don't. Yeah, and also just to give people some insight into, uh, what, <clears throat> excuse me, into what kind of effort playing with something like, like that would be. Like generally, I think if someone spends two weeks of an hour to a day, like trying to set up, hey, I want to deploy this thing clustered on Kubernetes, you'll figure it out. And then from that point on, that's a whole tool kit that you have at your disposal. So that's, I'm saying two weeks, you've got it covered. Yeah. Um, maybe because I came from a little bit more DevOps um, background on the first time I tried to play with Kubernetes, I, I kind of put it off. It sounded really cool. I kept asking the DevOps engineer at my last job to give us Kubernetes because as a, as an engineer who was just shipping products, I wanted to have that flexibility to easily deploy to, to a more flexible set of resources. Um, but I had put off learning it for a while. And when I finally bit the bullet and, and said, okay, I'm just going to see if I can get an app up and running. Um, I had my app running at the end of day one and a basic understanding of what pods were and services were. And by the end of day two, I had my CI builds or running a deploy um, to every time something got merged into master, they would deploy uh, and, and run a rolling update. So, um, so for me, it was kind of like two, two heavy days, uh, of learning. And, uh, and then after that, it's, uh, I, I think I've learned one or two more things in the six months since then. So, um, not, it's, it's not a crazy amount of effort to, to learn a little bit. Um, there always is the, the argument that like, well, if you only learn enough just to get running, there may be lots of gotchas that you don't haven't thought about yet. And that's very fair. If I, I wouldn't try to like, spend two days of learning and deploy somebody's, you know, multi-million dollar a year product 
onto two days of understanding, but, um, but you probably have more resources and, and people to help out at that point if, if that's what you're actually trying to deploy and work on. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash elixir. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through Triplebyte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Um, so I, one other topic I know, um, I know, Josh, this is something that you and I have uh, actually have some different opinions on and some different experience in. I'd like to chat a little bit about um, doing distributed systems kind of stuff in an Elixir project um, early on versus waiting to do those things. So, um, so from my perspective, uh, I, I've made a few mistakes in this area with some of my systems and um, maybe a couple of examples here. So um, I, I was super fascinated by the way that Phoenix pub sub works and how that hooks in with channels and everything so seamlessly. Um, and the default when you set up a new Phoenix project is that it's using PG2, which is this built-in library. It's part of the OTP standard library set of tools. And um, it kind of natively handles the fact that you might have multiple nodes running and that they cluster together. And if you publish a message from any one node in the cluster, all the other ones could be subscribed to that topic and, and get messages. You don't have to worry about publishing them once on each node. Um, and so, so I was like, that's great. I want that immediately put it into a system so that all my nodes were clustered and talking to each other, which is really not that hard. Um, and then once that was running, uh, I, um, I had to solve the problem of, uh, I, I now have three nodes and any one of them might notice something happening and publish a message. But if all three of them are supervising a process that's watching for some change, then every time something changes, I was actually publishing three copies of that message and everyone connected to any one of the nodes was getting three copies of that message. And um, I mean, that's not the end of the world. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it didn't really cause a problem, but it felt weird. And then I ended up spending, you know, two days diving into what's a good way to make only one of these things run across the whole cluster. And there's and lots now, of, And now you're on the leader election. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so they're like, there's simple ways to solve that problem. Um, but they have like, oh, if there's a, if there's a net split in the cluster, then these things happen versus those things happen. Um, in my case, I even also ran into the problem of, um, because I was at a company where this was our first Elixir app, um, I got it working in production. And a few weeks later, um, the ops team was adding in some additional firewalls to harden our security rules. And um, they didn't realize that these two apps needed to talk directly with one another. And, and so they put a firewall between them. And that meant that all of a sudden people who were connecting to the web app were getting like half the messages because I was only publishing the messages from one of the two nodes. Uh, and if you were connected to the other one, then you were missing this half of the messages or that half of the messages. And, um, and, and so, um, so I had some early pain uh, where I was like, oh man, I, I had to spend two days worrying about leader election and what happens in the case of net splits. Um, and then even when I went through those two days, I had the opposite problem where a net split did happen. And now I only was publishing the messages half and half. So, um, so that led me to kind of a conclusion of, Hey, maybe if I had just stuck with every single node publishing a copy of each message and not clustering them, that might've just been a simpler mental model for me to use and for my team to use because we weren't used to dealing with a, an application in production where, where the copies of the application were collaborating to share the load and to share the work. Um, and from a performance standpoint, we didn't really need the performance benefit of, of that collaboration. 
So, so that's kind of my background. That's, that's my take on, you know, maybe if you don't need to solve this problem now, um, give yourself some time, give yourself a few months of running in production before you decide to bite off that problem. Um, now I'd love to hear your, your experience, Josh, of, um, I, I think you generally are a proponent of, Hey, let's get clustering working like on day one of the project. Let's solve that problem. I, I'd love to hear about your, your, your reasoning. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the caveat that, yes, I have said I don't use Heroku, but if you're just playing with getting a, a chat app up, you probably just deploy to Heroku and use Redis for clustering. So, but if you're, if you're past that, like if you're, if you're not prototyping, um, this is one of the reasons that I think like having a, a real structure to your uh, infrastructure, like you know, having an infrastructure repo basically uh, is super valuable because... Uh, setting up clustering the first time inside of Kubernetes was like a pain. I had to figure out a bunch of stuff and so, and figuring out leader election for, um, in this case, we had a bunch of remote devices and we wanted to run. It didn't have to be exactly one process, but basically one process in the cluster per device that could sort of handle caching and some other things for it. Um, and that was a pain, but like now it's not a pain because I use libcluster. So do that if you want to do clustering. Um, if you're inside of Kubernetes, it's super easy. I already have Kubernetes templates for running my Elixir app. So like the labels that I use for clustering are wired in as variables. So that's trivial for me. Uh, use Swarm if you want, just if you just basically need something akin to leader election or having a thing running one place and then having it get taken over if that, if it goes away. Uh, Swarm is very good for that. So like once I'd dealt with all the pain, cause yeah, there was pain doing it the first time. Uh, but once I dealt with all the pain, like now I have this tool that's trivial for me to use in my toolkit versus a thing that maybe I would be interested in trying out architecturally, but I know it's a lot of pain that I haven't had yet. So I'll just try to get by. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I generally agree, like kicking the can down the road is totally fine if you have a thing you want to do. But if you take the time to learn this stuff, then like it makes you more powerful. Yeah, I, I think I, I would 100% agree with that. Um, and I, I think if... You know, I think in my situation, I was on a team that really wasn't like heavily bought into uh, Elixir being a major tool, a primary tool of the team, maybe. Um, and so if you're maybe more in that experimental phase um, where you're trying to convince other people on the team that Elixir is worth looking at or where, um, where it is just kind of experimental for your team, you're just trying to feel it out then maybe this, that's a great time to kick this can down the road and treat your app more like a stateless app. Um, because if that's what you have experience with, then you know, not opening, not dealing with any of the issues around clustering and distributed systems can be a great way just to save time and have a really good first experience with the, with the technology. You'll still get lots of great benefits like the you know, fault tolerance, uh, resiliency, performance, uh, really good concurrency concepts in the language, all of those things will still be benefits for you to use, even if your apps are not clustered together and collaborating with one another. So um, I think that's a great place to start if you're kind of in that experimental phase. I think if you have decided like, hey, this is a tool that we as a team are gonna use and we're all getting behind it, absolutely worth the time it takes to, to talk through like, okay, we need to deal with leader election and do we want to, you know, if the apps can't talk to each other, do we want a copy on both sides? Do we want to just wait and make people, you know, make that feature unavailable for a little while? Um, there's lots of decisions you need to make in that case and making them early on is just going to keep paying dividends, like release after release after release, you're going to get value out of having, um, having a decision on your team early on. Yeah, that's the, that's the biggest benefit. I think that's why I like the first thing we do in any project is we set up deployment and continuous integration and continuous deployment and uh, you know, feature branch environments and all that jazz. Because yeah, like it's, it's kind of a boring slog for the first few days of a project, but then like it's a tool you use every day, every time you push a, a PR and not having that tool and kicking that can down the road is uh, not something I want to do from a long-term productivity standpoint. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I had um, the last long-term project that I worked on um, before my current company, we had like a one-click deploy. It was mostly a one-click deploy plot process, but it's, it's really interesting that just because that was a manual process, 
then there was kind of these expectations like, hey, if you're the one who hits the button that sends it to production, you know, keep an eye on it. Like maybe check the server metrics for watch them for a few minutes during the deploy and after the deploy, maybe like, you know, hit something on the website that, you know, exercises that part of things that was generally considered like, Hey, you should be responsible because you're the one that clicked the button to go to production. And it's amazing thinking back how many hours and hours <laughs> of time, you know, probably literally weeks worth of, uh, on the, on, on work time, I spent just hitting that button and watching things for a few minutes. Um, and, and sometimes I absolutely caught problems as a result of that. But uh, looking back and weighing it in retrospect, I really wish that earlier on we had just made a decision of, hey, this is the flow. We're going to set up better metrics or better alarms or alerts earlier on in, the, in that team's lifetime. And it would have just saved me you know, an hour here, an hour there over the next four years of my life. So, um, so I'm a, I, I'll, be, I'll be totally on board with you there, Josh. Like, absolutely worth spending the time to set up those kinds of tools early on. I'd actually love to hear a little bit about what you do for feature branch uh, environments. Can you give just a, like an example? That's, that's something I haven't taken the time to set up um, and would love to hear a little bit about how you do that. Well, so right now I am looking at uh, using Jenkins X for that. So that's a thing that I'm sort of fiddling with right now. Uh, so we've done like sort of one-off feature branch environments and that's easy enough. You just spin up a thing, but it was a moderately manual process. You know, you actually set up a deployment uh, on Kubernetes. But um, doing it automated with Jenkins X looks like where I want to go. If you haven't looked at it, it's uh, Kubernetes native Jenkins pipelines, basically. And it has uh, a lot of the features of sort of a CI CD platform kind of baked into it, uh, but within the same cluster that it's doing the deployment to basically. So uh, it's, it's really neat, but yeah, I haven't actually used it so much as played with it a very minimal bit and it's on my list to set up. Uh, I will definitely be checking that out. I, I've heard about Jenkins X and mainly ignored it just because previous experience with Jenkins was um, not great. Uh, but again, that, that was an N of one. It was just one experience that I had with Jenkins that didn't go very well. Um, and it had a whole lot of history for why that was the case. So I'll definitely be taking a look at that. That's interesting to think about that being kind of bundled in with other tools already running in production. Uh, maybe we can do a future follow-up uh, about what we learned. Cause I, I'm, I'm also playing around with that at the moment. And you know, toying around with ideas like, oh, do you, you know, do I set up a whole cluster? Um, lots of those kinds of ideas, um, just to make sure that it's easy to say, oh, I want, I want a copy of basically everything with the master branches, but just this one thing I want on a feature branch uh, to see if I can poke at it a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention while I'm thinking about it uh, was what, what you described yourself doing was basically being a readiness probe slash a monitoring dashboard for production deploys, but only at the moment that you thought it needed to be run. Uh, essentially. <laughs> so I was just going to say like, yeah, so people that do that to kick the can down the road, I understand why it happens, but ultimately like you are better served by setting up uh, Prometheus and Grafana for your monitoring and setting up alerts. And again, yes, it takes a little extra time, but somebody's going to be doing it and it's better if it's a computer that you, pay per CPU second on than a person <laughs> who like has a family and also gets really bored and doesn't want to be doing this. And why are you making me do this? Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like if you're, if you're like, Oh, but how do I solve that problem? Just set up a readiness probe and a liveness probe on your Kubernetes deployment and then set up a, an endpoint that it hits that, that checks stuff. And then not only when things are unready because a deployment went poorly, but if things become unready or, you know, a node goes down because it can't talk to an external service, you're checking in your liveness probe, then like your cluster reacts appropriately. It's a lot more robust than just, I'm checking if this deploy worked. <laughs> Josh, I've never felt more proud of my history and more ashamed of my history at the same moment. <laughs> that's, that's really pretty much exactly what I was. I was we, we've I all was, been a readiness probe, dude. <laughs> Oh man, so many hours of, you know, I, I yeah, 
just being exactly that, just like, oh, I was doing this thing. And the reality was I was looking at the, at the Grafana dashboards. We had all that infrastructure set up. You know, we, had, we were 90% of the way there. And it, you know, at some point, someone's like, oh, this is a good enough set of tools. And we just didn't revisit it. So yeah, if you want to feel truly sad, realize that most people in pull request reviews apparently work as a code formatter. And that's, oh. like what, that's what they're doing during it. So I'll, I'll revisit, hey, run a formatter and don't, don't deviate from the format it gives you and don't think about that thing with your life because you're, you're better than that. Okay, so this does not probably not fall into like production pitfall pontification, but uh, can we make a point of like in your CI, set up, you know, run mix format, dash, dash, check format. Um, and Fail hard. And uh, warnings as errors. <laughs> and also um, Credo, like maybe spend the time. I, I know Credo is probably not as much of a slam dunk decision, um, but talk to your team. And if people feel good about it, set up Credo and some threshold within Credo of, hey, these are things that we're just going to check. And if our team values them, then we're going to automate the check for them. We're not going to humanize the check for these things because that's not what you should be doing in a code review. Yep. All of that, all of that. And I, I do feel like that should fall into the production pitfalls thing because I feel like spending your, your cycles as, because it's not just production, like I have code running on a server, it's production, like get this feature delivered for the end users. That's how we should be thinking of it. And from that perspective, spending your most expensive resources time, like arguing about semicolons at the end of a line is a really dumb business decision. <laughs> I mean, you just got two one-ups just while saying that. That's how good of an idea this is. So plus one, plus one, plus one. Ha. Also, I'll be setting do not disturb. <laughs> um, one other, so one other topic that I wanted to touch on in distributed systems, um, uh, something that I've, I've made the mistake at least once and, and seen other people make a similar mistake in, in this realm of like distributed systems and really cool tools that are at your fingertips but that you may want to uh, kick the can down the road a little bit. Um, for me, amnesia definitely fits into this. So um, the idea of being able to like store all of the data of your application in the native data format, like you don't have to worry about how dates get serialized to the database or does this timestamp get turned into you have UTC time when it goes to the database. In fact, like there, you know, there is really a lot of small decisions that happen when you decide to, to use a database or, or any sort of persistence layer that isn't in your same primary tool that you're building in. So totally agree with that. And that makes Amnesia feel like a really amazing tool because it's a database. It has a lot of work that's gone into it over the years. It has asset transactions. Um, again, I get all the reasons for saying, oh wow, we should totally use this in our application. Um, that being said, if you are gonna use it in your application in production, you should definitely spend a couple of days reading up on things like net splits because, um, you know, I, I actually first ran into problems with this when I was uh, working on a team that wasn't using Elixir or Erlang, but we were running RabbitMQ in production and RabbitMQ uses Amnesia to, to like persist what messages are going to who. And um, if you ever have a net split and then, it, and then your nodes come back together, RabbitMQ pretty much just blows itself up and enforces you to manually deal with, uh, with data conflicts between the two halves before it's ready to, to start back up and continue business as usual. And I remember when the, the first time that happened to me, I thought, wait, isn't this like, this is like what these tools are built for, right? Like that's why you guys picked Erlang is because it's so good at these problems. Um, and, and the reality is that that's just a design decision that the, that the people building Amnesia chose early on. You know, they chose to tackle some really hard problems and to ignore other ones. That's what all of us do all the time. These are totally reasonable decisions. But if you're, if you're thinking of the trade-off between like a centralized database like Postgres or Amnesia, it's definitely a topic that you need to spend some time thinking about because you're, you're buying a new set of semantics. Um, with that decision. So um, I'll also put in a quick pick here for a package called LBMKV. It's like a really small package on HexPM. Um, it's actually an Erlang package that's been around for a long time, but, but eventually got pushed to HexPM. Has very little changes over time, 
all it really does is wrap up Amnesia into a pretty simple key value um, API. And under the hood, it just wires up um, things like, oh, if there are net splits or if there's data um, collisions, it, it has like a default mechanism just to be like randomly choose one side, um, which is good enough for a lot of application usages. And what it does is every time you write a key into the, into the store, it forces a, con a consistent write across your whole cluster. And I benchmarked this in a, in a production app um, on some AWS eight core servers. I had like three of them clustered together and I could do like 10,000 writes a second. So um, if, you're, if your applications live close to each other in terms of network distance, um, this probably still works for a long time and can be a really simple way to get that sort of persistence layer um, built in to an application. But, um, but reaching for raw amnesia access um, just if you want to do it, spend some time reading because you'll want to know what are the gotchas and, and what to watch out for. Yes. So Josh, do, do we think that's a, is that a pretty good overview of, you know, of prediction pitfalls that people might run into? Are there other things that you think uh, we should, we should give a quick tip out for, for our listeners? Um, I've been thinking, I can't think of anything else really like that kind of encompasses my general how I feel about deploying Elixir apps right now. Great, I, I think I'm, I'm there as well. I think in a way, looking back at several years of running production Elixir apps, it's, um, it's notable that these are all of the major pitfalls that I run into. Um, and, and for the most part, things have been pretty stable. They work pretty much the same way they do on my local laptop. And, um, and I, I just haven't had a whole lot of need to worry about production being different from, from my development environment. So um, don't be afraid of putting stuff in production. It's great. Water's warm. Come on in. Oh, one thing. Do be afraid of uh, connecting to a remote node in production and not being really careful about the fact that, yeah, you're on production. I haven't made a mistake yet, but... I become I become nervous because every now and then I'll be in a REPL and I'll be like, wait a second, this is production. <laughs> so don't yeah, so don't be mindless. Whenever you feel your keys typing D E L, um, you know, take a second and ask yourself if this is production. <laughs> yeah, no, I never I, I never do that. Uh, back in the Rails days, uh, one of the guys that worked for me monkey patched Rails to uh, basically make delete all and no op in production, and instead it just printed out James just saved your job. And uh, people, people would tell him when they saw the message. And so, so we found out that that was a thing that actually needed saving. That's amazing. That's such a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, and yeah, I don't think we actually need to probably give very many examples of that. I think anyone who's been deploying things for a little while in any language knows some stories of uh, people running migrations accidentally against production or you know, deploying or running a rake task that should have not been done in production, et cetera. Um, oh, and well, actually, maybe we should wrap up and, and we can turn this now into picks. Are you good with that? Yeah, that's fine with me. All right. My first pick in this case will be uh, a book called Erling and Anger. It's available free on a website and downloadable as a PDF. Uh, it's written by Fred Abair, um, who was a guest on this show a little while ago, an episode I missed. Dang it. But um, he, it's, uh, he wrote it during the time when he was working for Heroku on their routing system. And it talks a little bit about things that you really can do in a production console and things you really maybe shouldn't do. So um, for instance, there's sometimes that you can trace function calls. And if it's a function call that happens constantly, then that might be a bad idea because it might add a whole bunch of load to servers that are already suffering. So um, great book, has a lot of really uh, neat ideas. Um, and also um, he ended up publishing a tool um, that uh, he built along the process of, of writing that book. So um, really high quality content if you are thinking about um, stuff in production. But also I learned a ton of techniques for like things I didn't realize that I could do. You can trace, um, hey, every time a message is received by this one gen server, I want to see what messages it's receiving and you can trace that. And that, that's like pretty amazing that you can do things like that in, uh, in a runtime system and watch what's really happening in production. So um, just 
uh, absolutely worth the read. And is that tool called Recon? Is that the same? Yes, yes, thank you. I actually was trying to remember what that, what that tool is called, but you're right, it's Recon. Yeah, cool, cool. That's it for me. Okay, well, I have exactly one, and it's a podcast. It is not remotely, well, it's, it's not tech-related, uh, although one of the hosts is John C. Dvorak, who wrote a million uh, tech magazine columns that I read when I was young. Anyway, but it's also Adam Curry, who was a former MTV VJ and uh, was the guy who invented podcasting. So um, anyway, really, really good. What they do is media deconstruction. So it's a podcast basically of clips of uh, stories going around in the media. It's really interesting when they play like eight clips from different networks and they all are using the exact same strange terminology and you realize, oh, yeah, there was an email. Somebody was told to use these words. Uh, because no one would say that normally and certainly not eight independent people. Anyway, so seeing that sort of thing just broken down in front of you is very, very interesting because I'm always trying to be careful about uh, the way people are trying to make me think. That's a, that's a great pick. Actually, that maybe gives me one more pick. Um, there's a great YouTube series. Um, if anybody has um, watched the Smarter Every Day channel on YouTube, it's fairly popular. It's very uh, physics and engineering um, more mechanical or uh, kind of systems engineering thinking than software, but um, but it's a great channel. And he had a recent series about um, social me media manipulation, where people are are trying to you know for advertising purposes or, or monetary purposes or whatever, they have some reason for trying to um, create a a certain narrative using social media platforms. It was really really interesting to see the techniques that are being employed and also how. Um, how software engineers at these different uh, social media platforms try to combat them, um, but, but how successful and unsuccessful they are. So I'll link to I that mean, as well. Do they try to combat them or do they try to monetize them? <laughs> uh, we'll leave that as an, as an exercise for the, for the listeners. Uh, it sounded to me like at least some people there are, have a uh, really good intention to, to keep the signal clear and representing individual humans. Um, but I would say that's not universally a value of all the companies involved. It sounds like maybe the, the line engineers haven't been read in on the business plan is all I'm saying. <laughs> maybe so. All right. Um, well, I think that does it for this week then. Thanks so much, Josh. And um, thanks everyone for listening and for joining us once again for Elixir Mix. And we'll see you all later. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.